Hi there, welcome back to Mudwalkers. My name is Chris. If you're not already a member on Patreon, go ahead and hit that Patreon link in the description below and check out all my stuff over there. Um, hit the follow button on Vimeo, the rumble button on Rumble, like, share, subscribe on YouTube, all the things. Uh, let's get into the video, but first, neat camera trick. There we go. Okay, today's video is inspired by Nudity and Christianity, edited by James C. Cunningham. I highly recommend this book. It's, uh, it's not super expensive to pick up, at least it wasn't when I bought it. But, uh, yeah, anyway, <clears throat> there was a neat little story in there about uh, the man we're going to talk about today. So let's get started. It's about a Christian brother whose name was Alejandro Labaca. And uh, he wrote a diary about his time among the Warani people. Wow, Waurani? The Waurani people and the adjustments that he had to make. And he was uh, working with them for apparently several years. And his diaries are um, really fascinating from what I hear. I haven't picked up a copy myself yet, but I did find an article from that book in Nudity and Christianity, which is uh, where I got all the information I'm about to share with you now. He tells a story of going down to the river in the Amazon to wash up. And obviously there weren't a lot of like, modern ways to clean up because he's way out in the jungle but so, so what he had to do was he had to go down to the river and take a bath in the water and he had to basically just rinse off his clothes in the, the river water and then he laid his clothes up on the shore to dry and he sat there and he just kind of was waiting for his clothes to dry all by himself naked out in the jungle and uh, he says that he started to contemplate Paul's words in Romans 13 let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and instead clothe ourselves in the armor of light. I think that's how it goes. If not, I'll put it down below and correct myself. So yeah, he's out there waiting for his clothes to dry. And then he wasn't alone anymore. A couple of families from the local village showed up and they started getting in the water themselves. And uh, as, you know, a European descended guy, Labaco was kind of like taken aback by the fact that they didn't have any problem with him sitting there naked. Um, the, the text in Nudity and Christianity doesn't mention this, but these people were very likely naked, at least by our standards, Kivi'u standards. And uh, yeah, he just kind of sat there while they did their thing, and it was um, kind of a culture shock for him. They were naked because their culture is taru'u, and they, they live according to the demands that the land sets on them. Um, our culture is Kivi'u, and that's totally different. So... By their standards, they're dressed normally and appropriately, but by our standards, they would be called naked by, you know, Kivi'e standards. Anyway, while uh, Labaka was sitting there, this, uh, this local man comes up and offers to help Labaka look more culturally appropriate. And the man provided him with a gumi. A gumi is a, uh, a string that uh, goes around the waist and um, holds the penis up vertically. Uh, not in a state of arousal, uh, still flaccid, but just held vertically. It's just how, how they do it. Um, you'll find that a lot of cultures that Kivi'u people, you know, civilized people, first world people, you'll find that a lot of cultures where we would call them naked, uh, they still have standards for how certain body parts are meant to appear in public to be considered decent. Among the Wawarani, the, um, the standard is you, you got to have a string on there holding it upright, which I know sounds weird to us. It would seem more indecent to us, but it's more decent to them. And the, uh, the Thoe, also and, and another Amazon, Amazonian people, uh, they actually, all their men tie a, uh, I think it's the leaf from a reed plant around the base of the penis to cover the shaft, but the head of the penis is uh, exposed. And so we would... And so we would, a civilized culture like ours, a European uh, descended culture like ours would call that naked, but to them that's dressing appropriately for their circumstances. Often these, uh, in these cultures, men will be considered indecent if they don't have the string on or the, the leaf on. 
I can't speak to the Wawarani, that subject wasn't covered in this book, but I know among the, the Thoe, according to the documentary I watched a few years ago, um, it's, uh, it's not well looked on to walk around without your leaf tied around the base of your penis. It's, uh, it sounds super weird to us, this is how it works over there. I'm sure they would think that we're weird too. After Labaka put on the gumi, he, he walked with the man back up to the village so that his clothes could finish drying. And even up there in the village, he was walking around dressed like a Wawarani man. And he was, you know, still trying to like come to grips with the fact that these Wawarani people weren't shocked or offended or any of these things. Didn't consider, consider him indecent because he was naked according to Kavi'u standards, according to civilized standards. Um, the fact that they could see his penis wasn't the issue, as long as he had it tied properly, that was the key. And so, uh, yeah, he writes about still trying to adjust to that up in the village. Um, eventually, he became so familiar with these people, so beloved, that he ended up becoming a, an honorary member of the tribe, which is super cool. Once Labaka became an authority figure over the other Christians bringing the Christian message to the Waurani, he required the people under his authority to bring the Christian message to the Waurani dressed the way the Waurani dress. Which meant, again, in Kivi'u terms, they had to be naked. Why is that? Well, uh, because Labaka believed that any social or cultural barrier that stands between you and sharing the gospel with someone, you should try to overcome. If you can overcome it without violating scripture or your own conscience, you should uh, you, you should cross over that social barrier, that cultural barrier, yourself. And since there's no rule in scripture against quote-unquote nudity, the way that the Wawadani dress, and being Catholic, Labaka was probably aware that the Catholic Church has taken a fairly permissive stance toward nudity. Um, Labaka didn't see any issue with it, and neither do I. I think it's a, a, I think it's a good practice. This distinguishes Labaka's approach from other European-descended missionaries who try to bring the gospel into certain places, but then try to force the indigenous peoples or the local peoples to dress the way that the missionaries dress based on their home culture, which is not, not the best way to do it, I think. Demanding that these people dress in European-style clothes is inappropriate, not just because you're levying ridiculous, empty rules on people, but because there's a reason why their cultures dress this way. There's a reason why their culture, you know, abandoned clothes eons ago, likely for environmental reasons. It's a tropical climate. It's hot. It's also very humid, and that comes together to make a very um, healthy breeding ground, well, not healthy for humans, a, a, a vibrant breeding ground for parasites, bacteria, and mold, all of which are exasperated by European-style clothing coverage. In fact, when people of European descent travel into the Amazon, you know, way out into the jungle, they're cautioned to take very good care of their skin and their clothes because you'll develop all kinds of horrible problems with your body underneath your clothes if you don't take proper precautions. Plus, uh, the, according to the, the current consensus about prehistorical North American migration, the indigenous peoples of North and South America came from Siberia via Alaska and spread southward. And if that's true, then that means that their ancestors came from the Arctic, which means they had to know what clothes were or they would have died out. And as they filtered in across Canada and the United States and into Mexico and into South America, these people gradually abandoned the idea of clothes as, as we would call clothes. Um, and so as we come into their world, as, as aliens in their world, it behooves us to ask the question, why? Not to just assume, you know, oh, they're naked, it's a sin. It's, okay, well, if their ancestors really came from Siberia, then how and why did they give up the, on the idea of clothing? Um, that's a, an important question. We need to try to understand this issue from their point of view before we try to start shoving European clothing ideas into their culture. Because I guarantee you their ancestors knew what clothes were because they came from a cold place and then they gave them up on purpose. So there's probably a reason for that. Why was it culturally mandatory in Europe to wear a hat, a scarf, long sleeves, long pants, gloves, and closed-toed shoes? Maybe because Europe is cold. And in order to like 
function in that region, you have to cover up. And then ubiquity evolves into propriety. That's what happens cross-culturally. So let me say it again. Ubiquity evolves into propriety. And then, of course, the climate does a lot to dictate what becomes ubiquitous. Like, for example, if you're living in the Arctic, boots will be ubiquitous. And so boots probably become a part of propriety over time. So uh, if culture dictates, if climate dictates what becomes ubiquitous, and then ubiquity determines what becomes proper, we should see that pattern play out across different cultures in both directions. And we do see that. It shouldn't surprise us, for example, that here in America, our, you know, modesty standards have slackened considerably over the last few hundred years. Because we started out the same as Europe. Hats, scarves, long sleeves, long pants, closed-toed shoes, and that other thing. What was that? I forgot it. Anyway, uh, maybe it was gloves. Yeah, I think it was gloves. But um, these things have become gradually less necessary culturally. Why? Because the, the climate here is way different. Here in Louisiana, it is February right now. February, right this instant. There are places in the world where there are blizzards going on. There's snow in the northern United States. It's, it's freezing temperatures all over the northern hemisphere right now in the middle of winter, but here I am in Louisiana, and it's in the 50s Fahrenheit, which is this warm in Celsius. Yes, I'm American. I don't know Celsius. So naturally, the climate is going to dictate a different, uh, that different things become ubiquitous. So what we have here in America is that long sleeves, that's no longer mandatory. Neither are hats. You don't have to wear a hat to be seen as, you know, uh, dressed properly out in a public setting. You don't have to wear long sleeves. You can wear short sleeves. You can wear short pants. You can wear sandals. Or in a lot of places, you can wear no shoes at all. Even out in public on a sidewalk. No one's going to, like, you know, uh, harass you or get you arrested because you're barefoot. Similarly, uh, it's so hot here in the States that men fought for the right to be shirtless in America, and they won. They got the right. And now women are working on the same right. Why? Because it's hot here. It sucks wearing a shirt all the time. Why, why would you want us to keep wearing something that's so unnecessary? But see, the natural conclusion to all this is what I'm wearing. That when it's comfortable outside, you just dress comfortably. People should just be free to, to not wear pretty much anything. Everything I'm wearing right now, I'm wearing for a practical reason. I'm holding the stick because it's cool. But uh, I'm wearing a hair tie because it keeps the hair out of my face while the wind is blowing. I'm, I'm wearing this, this neck knife because it holds my microphone in place. I'm wearing the microphone because I want you to actually be able to hear me over the wind. And so everything I'm wearing, or, uh, well, the stick isn't very, uh, you know, practical. But everything I'm wearing, I'm wearing for a practical reason. And nothing else was really, you know, necessary, so I didn't wear it. And so what we see across cultures, again, is that the climate dictates what becomes ubiquitous, and then ubiquity dictates propriety. So allow these peoples, wherever you go in the world, you know, try to understand why it became ubiquitous and then why it became proper. And try and, you know, if, 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 you, can, if you can leave it alone, just leave it alone. This episode of Mudwalkers has been brought to you by my generous supporters over on Patreon. These guys are making the channel happen. These guys are keeping mud walkers rolling forward into the future and doing bigger and better things. Yeah, you see this right here? That came from Patreon. Um, the, the microphone you see came from Patreon. Uh, I, I am going, like I said, I'm, I'm moving forward. Mud walkers is doing bigger and better things in 2024 because of Patreon. So if you'd like to support what I do for $5 a month, $10 a month, for one month, two months, 100 months, whatever you wanna do, uh, there's a Patreon link down in the description down below down and down below anyway but there's a link down below uh, patreon.com slash mudwalkers anytime that you want to get involved and support uh, what I do that would be very much appreciated we also have a monthly uh, Skype call that we do with all the $10 patrons and above and we get to share ideas and swap stories and just in general hang out and have a good time I, uh, I really like uh, that that video call that I get to do with my patrons every month it's uh, it's one of the highlights of um, mudwalkers honestly is getting to talk to you guys but I'm rambling at this point, so let's get back into the video. Once the Baca became an authority figure over the, the Christian missionaries, because um, obviously the Baca was a Christian, but uh, once the Baca... Anyway, 
Labaka required that the missionaries under his authority strip themselves naked before they encounter, encountered the Waurani. Now, why this is interesting is because it's before. Not once they encountered the Waurani, it was before they encountered them. <clears throat> what Labaka was getting at is, this isn't something that the Waurani should be forcing you to do. This is something that you should do freely, voluntarily, preemptively, to show how important it is to them that you, you show them respect and love. Labaka also remarks that this was especially difficult for the female missionaries, which I totally get. Um, I, I have a lot of respect for the women and men out there who, who actually did this. Um, wherever you are, ma'am, sir, I commend you. I'm not saying all missionaries should get naked, please understand. But I am saying that whatever the cultural standards of dress are in the place where you're going to be a missionary, prepare yourself to dress like the locals. That means if you're going to go in the Amazon, you should wear like a loincloth. If they wear loincloths, you should wear a gumi. If they wear gumis, you should wear the little leaf wrapping if they do those. Um, if you're going to a Muslim country, you should, as a man, you should consider wearing a kaftan and, uh, uh, or a, a turban, whatever the headdress is where you're going to be. If you're a woman going into an Islamic country, um, you know, consider wearing a hijab or a, a burqa even. I mean, dress according to the local customs. This will do a lot for um, getting people to listen and feel have people feel respected. I know that it's not altogether rational and maybe it's not even right um, to expect that from newcomers, from foreigners. But I will say that when when people show up to like the UN and things in uh, different garb, I, I don't relate to them as much as I do when they wear something that looks more American, which I think is a cultural hang up on my part that I need to work on getting past. But because of that, I can, I can see why this would be an effective strategy for getting that foot in the door in missionary work. Uh, I, I relate to it. You don't expect these people to suddenly speak English when you go into mission work. So why would you expect them to dress English when you're going into missionary work? Um, the way that someone is comported, the way that someone behaves overall, which includes how someone dresses, um, that's all kind of uh, like cultural dialectic. It's almost a language unto itself, the way that you dress. Um, I've even argued that, that the way you dress is actually a language. It's a nonverbal language, but you communicate a lot about yourself, about your values, your priorities, according to how you dress. So what I'm communicating with, uh, with this, I don't know, but I'm communicating something, or maybe I'm not communicating at all, I don't know. But speak to people on their level and on their terms when it comes to mission work. This is the example that Labaka set, and I think it's something that we can feel good about imitating him in. On July 21st, 1987, Alejandro Labaca died doing what he loved most, extending a hand of friendship and love to the indigenous people of the Amazon. Um, while he was attempting to make contact with an uncontacted tribe, the tribe actually speared him to death along with his companion, um, and they died right, right there. Um, Lamaka left behind instructions regarding his death because he always knew that there was a, there was a decent possibility that um, things weren't always going to be hunky-dory with the people in the jungle. Um, in that particular case, uh, tensions were very high at the time because there was a lot of petroleum work that was encroaching on indigenous land and um, this indigenous group just wasn't having it anymore. So when they saw someone that looked um, kivi'u, looked civilized, looked European-ish, they just, they reacted with force. Um, maybe it was reasonable, maybe it was unreasonable, but um, regardless, uh, it's murder. They should not have killed Lavaca uh, or his companion. It's a, it's a sad, sad thing. In life, Lavaca was a tireless advocate for indigenous rights. He did everything he could to impede the, the encroachment of Kivi into indigenous land 
Uh, he fought against petroleum projects. He fought against land development in the Amazon. Uh, he was a tireless fighter, you know, not like, you know, fighter, like a, a tireless advocate for the people, um, which, yeah, I, I respect that. Like I said, Labaka left behind instructions regarding his death, um, which are phrased a certain way, so I'm actually going to read them because I don't want to, you know, slip up trying to say it from memory. Um, he demanded that nothing whatsoever was to be done to any indigenous people who, uh, who killed him. Nothing should be done to avenge him or to punish his killers. Instead, in the event that he was killed by an indigenous group, he wrote that his wish was, quote, that not a single drop of blood be shed. I will die content for those Indians whom I love dearly. Let's be more like Alejandro Labaca in these ways. I, I can't speak to the rest of his life. I mean, maybe, maybe in other ways that he was a jerk. I, I know nothing about the rest of his life other than what I've read in this article in the book, Nudity and Christianity. I know nothing else about the man. But based on what I've read here and a couple articles I looked up online, um, I'm going to guess that he was a really, really great guy. And uh, I wish that Christian mission, mission work could be more like that across the Amazon. But uh, I'm rambling, so I'm going to get out of here.